Hello and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Sudhakar Velamore. I'm a VP of Engineering at Coda, and um, I've been in healthcare for the last seven years and building technology for healthcare. And prior to that, I've built a lot of platforms and products for across finance and healthcare. So uh, I'll pass it off to Brooke. Hi, I am Brooke Grumman. I'm the VP of Product at Coda, where I oversee our technology-enabled abstraction platform. I have a background in clinical trials, specifically in targeted therapeutics. So today we'll be discussing leveraging healthcare NLP models in regulatory grade oncology data curation. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so first, let's talk about um, some background about CODA. We're a healthcare company with a mission to bring clarity to cancer. Effectively, we combine our oncology expertise with advanced technology and analytics to organize real world data in order to guide decisions and actions. Next slide. So how we do it. We organize fragmented, often hidden data from the real world through tech-assisted and enhanced human abstraction. What does that mean? Um, in order to get data from our providers, we use our technology platform to curate, what we refer to as abstract, information from the EMR. The data that's brought in then gets standardized into our clinical data model. Um, it then gets refined and processed further with additional analytic measures. Um, and these data sets are used in our products, um, which are for healthcare providers, as well as clinical trial research in pharma. Next slide. So what is this information that we curate? We capture very deep clinical information throughout a patient's journey. So this could include elements such as a patient's medical history, molecular markers, outcomes, treatments, um, and many other elements. Um, and most are captured at multiple time points throughout the patient's journey and require um, multiple source documents to be leveraged from the EMR. So as an example on the bottom, you could see um, we might capture the first regimen a patient received. Um, and then we might indicate that this regimen was stopped because the patient progressed. We would then capture um, the patient's next regimen they run on, um, and maybe that was stopped as a result of a toxicity and they had to switch to an alternative treatment. Um, and so these are the, um, just examples of information that we capture throughout the patient's journey. Um, and with each of those, we have time points as well as um, detailed information um, surrounding all of the clinical context. And so with that, I will hand it back to Sadakar. All right. Um, so as Brooke mentioned, like we use cutting edge technology to enhance and assist clinical data abstraction of key elements for clinical and healthcare provider use cases. Um, yeah, this data about patients is often fragmented and it's multimodal, uh, like text, you know, uh, structured data and so on. And the process is expensive and requires clinical expertise. So uh, how do we extract meaningful and accurate information about patient journeys that can be used uh, to make solid decisions in the real world? Uh, there are options and some of them, you know, you can look at on the screen, but let's let's go through them. Uh, they, are, they have varying degrees of success. So for example, uh, the structured data from EMRs, uh, requires processing pipelines uh, that need to be continually checked and updated. Uh, since EMR versions across uh, different providers can be different. Uh, and also EMR data models between EMRs are different. And this challenge is compounded by, you know, the number of times that we have to go update maybe these processing pipelines. Um, but still it's a very critical source of information and therefore, you know, it's it's a must do for uh, all of our uh, operations. For unstructured notes, um, they also store critical information about patient treatments and help corroborate the data that's in that's found in structured EMR data. So, what are the options for processing unstructured data? Uh, one potential option with unstructured data is search or text processing. Um, this process uses rules, pattern matching, heuristics to extract data. Uh, however, the results can be unpredictable if there are even minor deviations from the rules and patterns that, that exist. And so, uh, obviously, you know, the, this area of uncertainty is what ML and AI try to solve for. 
Uh, when it comes to NLP um, specifically, since we're in the NLP summit, the there are a lot of models out there. Uh, this is a very active space, obviously, where newer technology is trumping the older ones. Um, but for healthcare, a lot of generic models exist, and these models are great at targeting chronic disease records like hypertension, diabetes, or heart disease. Uh, but when it comes to oncology, there are a lot of variables with respect to patient journey and treatments. Uh, it can make extracting data very difficult from using generic models. So sometimes the data that can be extracted from these generic models are also often found in the structured form of the EMR. Uh, and they are likely easier to extract from those sources than from unstructured text. So uh, beyond generic models, um, the, the right most, which is like the, the highest part of the spectrum, uh, there are domain specific pre-trained NLP models. And of course, Spark NLP provides a lot of them. Uh, these are great for uh, a start, uh, but you, your use case might actually require further tuning uh, based on the performance of the model in your context. So um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so in terms of the NLP use cases that we've explored at Coda, uh, you know, I've placed sort of, you know, stuff on the left and stuff on the right. Uh, the, the stuff on the left, you know, obviously the unstructured text, um, NLP obviously, uh, can be used in a variety of ways. So since data quality is a very uh, important concern in terms of regulatory grade extraction of data, uh, direct output from these models uh, requires some human review. And the use cases we've explored in unstructured text are highlighting relevant text for abstraction and extraction of data for review and usage. And for structured data, we've explored extraction of normalized data such as drugs from free text fields or de-identification of free text or structured text. Uh, in both cases, um, there are a lot of pre-trained models. Uh, so navigating those is important while exploring and continued improvement and tuning of these models through active learning is the key. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, in terms of model enhancements, uh, one of the key aspects of getting models to work for you is to keep improving them, right? So in this flow diagram, you can see that the process of data extraction and improvement of models. Um, data which is structured and, or unstructured first optionally gets de-identified and categorized. Uh, once categorized, the data elements uh, can be extracted from some, such documents and presented to humans through a web app or some other mechanism where curation will occur. Uh, once presented, the clinical expert can then determine uh, whether the data is correct and they can highlight, uh, pass feedback through highlights uh, back to the model. And in order to do this, um, we, we need some tooling such as uh, the NLP lab that, uh, that Spark NLP provides or other mechanisms uh, to be able to take the data that for feedback and pass it back onto the model uh, so that we can continue to improve. Uh, also important to watch out uh, is where the feedback goes because there could be multiple models that contribute to the single data extraction process and you need to be able to pass the right feedback to the right model. Um, so, so that's just the summary of all the different models and kinds of things that we've done. Uh, we'll go into more specifics now and I'll pass it back to Brooke. Great, thanks. So um, I'm gonna highlight our first two use cases, um, how they went, some challenges and things that we learned along the way. Um, so just some background to get us started. Our first two use cases were adverse events and B symptoms. So an adverse event is any unfavorable or unintended sign, symptom, or disease temporally associated with the use of medical treatment. You'll oftentimes also hear this called or referred to as a toxicity. Um, and the ontology, which is used um, most commonly today, is the common terminology criteria for adverse events, um, which is also referred to as CTCAE. These symptoms um, are most common in patients with aggressive histologies, um, especially those who have hepatic or extranodal involvement, 
Um, and the three elements which make up these symptoms are fever, weight loss, and sweats. Um, next slide. So to jump in and show you um, two successes we had with the models, um, our first one here is adverse events. You can see it highlighted showing that um, neutropenia was a positive, so it, it um, was present as an adverse event. If you read the text there, you can see that the physician said um, the patient had mild neutropenia um, and they will defer treatment today. Um, so that is totally accurate there. Um, looking into B symptoms, um, you can see again present for B symptoms, um, weight loss, chills, and night sweats um, as documented clearly in that note. So next slide. Diving into our B symptom model um, a little bit more, um, one requirement we had of the model was that we had to see um, if lymphoma was present. That's because B symptoms are only re relevant um, for those disease types. So that was a prerequisite. Um, and then we additionally um, had a date of assessment associated with the B symptom. And so our initial accuracy um, was somewhat lower for the practical use cases. Um, we then had to use our clinical expertise to train the model. Um, and after training, it did increase a significant amount by 20%. Um, but again, um, we just need to increase this accuracy further um, with more training and again, just um, more uh, data points, um, which can be leveraged from a multitude of more um, documents. Next slide. So switching to some challenges. So this is just a visual representation of um, some issues that we faced. This top left here, you can see that um, it explains, the physician explains that the patient um, could have side effects of um, their therapy, cytopenias, um, neuropathy, et cetera. Um, and the model actually said, I, this is a positive B symptom, positive adverse event, negative adverse event, and turns out it's actually none of those um, because the physician is just saying it could happen, it didn't. Um, um, below that, you can see that it indicated that the patient's disease itself was actually an adverse event, which is incorrect. And then on the right-hand side, you can see um, what you commonly see in a note, a review of systems, um, which is saying positive and negative um, all over the place, but those are actually not adverse events. Um, and one other thing I wanted to highlight, as I mentioned earlier, is that we're using the CTCIE ontology. And so the, one of the challenges there is that often the documentation the physician uses is not one-to-one -one with um, the terminology in that ontology. So as a result, a doctor might say um, the patient experienced nosebleeds. Um, nosebleeds is not uh, in CTCAE. It would actually be epistasis. Um, and so there is some translation needed um, and synonyms you need to consider. The other challenge is that we are only interested in toxicities, which led to a change in therapy. You could see that um, in my earlier example, um, but one of the challenges there is that you need to be able to account for all the ways in which um, someone could say led to a change in therapy. So that made, made us have to um, go down the route of many synonyms. Um, and to limit um, the capture, like you can see on the right of review of symptoms, we started limiting the sections of the note, which were relevant um, for the model. For B symptoms, um, one thing I mentioned, I'll highlight again, is that um, something such as a fever could you know, get classified as a B symptom or a toxicity. And so you need to have the context surrounding um, those words to understand which it should accurately be. Um, and then one just general challenge using real world data is oftentimes physician notes um, are, are copy forward. So they'll take all the old information, copy it forward, and then add the new information. And so being able to accurately as associate a date with each of these can be quite challenging um, because you need to be able to isolate what point in the note is it, what actual date is it, um, to make sure you're accurately representing um, the patient's journey. Next slide. And so with that, we started to look um, towards a future use case, which is um, outcomes. Um, an outcome is just a measure of a patient's overall response to their therapy. It can range from a CR, which is a complete response, all the way to a progression or relapse. Um, and so as you can see here, the model is able to highlight favorable response to therapy, also known as a PR or a partial response. 
Um, but one challenge here is that that's only one way um, in which a doctor could say a patient had a partial response. They might use other words such as um, their disease is improving, they're showing a good response. And so a real challenge here is that there is no standard ontology um, at all. Um, this is truly um, variable by physician, by disease, by clinic. Um, and so as a result, we need um, a lot of training and a lot of um, documents to uh, tune this model more accurately. And so with that, I will hand it back to Sadakar. Yeah, thanks, Brooke. I think in terms of a, a summary, you know, this slide helps us understand the overall summary of the challenges as well as some of the positives of, of LP exploration as well as usage um, in our clinical data abstraction. Um, the challenges are, you know, obviously, when you're trying to identify healthcare-related data within unstructured text, uh, despite the fact that NLP for healthcare is, is progressing very rapidly, uh, the challenge is with, you know, specialized areas such as oncology, where the treatments are very personalized um, to a patient and so on and so forth. So the documents are not there. Uh, the second is creating completely new models from scratch to solve data extraction as possible, uh, but it requires a lot of in-house expertise in understanding how best to operationalize these models. Um, so again, the data for training is often sparse in oncology, so it's a very key aspect of challenge. Um, in terms of the positives, you know, uh, definitely uh, NLP models can help with the extraction of data at scale uh, with quality as long as there's a good review and learning process um, to continually improve. Uh, the time savings for human abstraction uh, in, in our case, and as well as others, can be realized in a targeted data extraction scenario uh, by highlighting as well as reviewing the extracted data, uh, not having to rely fully on the AI to give us the data. Then finally, uh, models can be improved with uh, you know data labeling and active learning this is very important um, as the tooling for this is essential for improving the accuracy of the models. Um, so, and finally, the multiple models, there are multiple models and pipelines uh, that might be needed in a single data point, uh, but there are lots of choices out there, so which is, which is helpful, uh, but requires uh, some additional work uh, to make that happen. Uh, with that, I wanted to thank everybody uh, for listening and, um, Brooke, anything else? No, that's all. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody.